panel, just a heads up, we're getting started at five. Can you tell me what pool line uh, the van one DC one was up to? Could be room ten too, Gary. What pool line DC one was up to? gather on in. Yeah. Pack it in. Pack it in, pack it in. Let's go Crenshaw. Let's go Marines. Listen, hey, thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we have here a group of combat veterans, uh, all of whom have served uh, this great nation uh, overseas, in combat, in the various branches, and have decided to continue their service uh, in the United States House of Representatives. Uh, they all know what it means to be on a team. They know what it means to sacrifice. They know that there are more men and women overseas right now putting their lives on the line for this republic than the entire British, Canadian, and Australian military combined. Uh, and they know what it means to be worthy and conduct themselves in a way that is worthy of the sacrifices for the men and women we couldn't bring home or who came home literally missing limbs uh, and forever altered upstairs. So uh, I'm going to hand off in just a moment, but before I do, to get their perspective on what this all means to us, why they ran and what's going on in the last few days. But before I do, I just want to take a minute to read what our adversaries are saying. 
uh, in North Korea, in Iran, in Venezuela, in Cuba, authoritarian regimes all over the world are pointing to what's going on in the House of Representatives and saying, look at the messiness of democracy, look at how it doesn't work, how it can't function, and in contrast to their authoritarian regimes. Uh, and just a couple of quotes from Chinese state media from the Global Times. Uh, the events are chaotic, phenomena of spread and aggravation of the disease of the U.S. political system. What happened in the highest hall of U.S. democracy is not a simple farce, but a political thriller with huge destructiveness and a wide-ranging and far-reaching impact. Faced with the political chaos in the U.S., there is a sharp question whether the political class of the country is able to govern and whether the internal conflicts and contradictions of one of the major political parties contaminate the entire system. Looks, I think my colleagues would join me in that this is unacceptable. Some points have been made, concessions have been made, and now is time to move on, to move forward, and to govern as the Amer in the, the way the American people elect us to do. And I will hand off to one of our newest colleagues, former Navy SEAL, Representative Van Orden, Representative-elect Van Orden. Representative-elect, yes, for sir. a reason. All right. I am not a member of Congress yet, and as a matter of fact, there is no Congress right now, because we're at an impasse. So you're looking at 291 years of military service, myself including everybody behind me. I'll say that again, 291 years of collective military service. Combat deployments, we've spent years and years away from our home serving our nation proudly. I'm 53 years old. I've had 50 of my friends killed in training and combat since 9-11. And we must absolutely understand the gravity of what we're talking about. We are here to serve the American people. We all put a uniform on before. Well, this is my uniform now. And I plan on serving the people of the United States of America. The people standing behind me have regularly, consistently, over decades, proven that they're willing to put something greater than themselves above themselves. It's service over self. I'm incredibly proud to be a member of this august body, and I want to make sure that everybody out there understands what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to make sure that we can do the people's will. And a minority of our party has decided that they want to continue with this obstructionism, and it's actually becoming detrimental to our nation and I will not stand for that. So with that, thank you very much and uh, I'll turn it over to Representative Dan Crenshaw. Thank you all for being here. It's an honor to be joined by uh, my fellow veterans, served abroad, served this country. And um, I suppose I would say a few things uh, about service and why we serve. We all served in different ways, but we mostly served for the same reason, so that we would take the fight to the enemy, and the enemy would not no longer take the fight to the American people. We had purpose. We had mission. That was our mission. We have mission up here. Some people have different priorities. Some people want to cut spending. Some people want to fix our, our mandatory spending problems. Some of us want to fix the border, deal with the Mexican drug cartels that are murdering uh, tens of thousands of Americans a year by poisoning them with fentanyl. There's a lot of missions that we have up here. I don't think that the American people care about any of these so-called missions happening this week. Rules changes, who gets more power, who gets on what committee. I can't think of one American who gives a damn about any of that. They care about the mission. And the conservative agenda is one that will accomplish the mission for the American people the best, but we can't start that agenda until we start governing. That's why we're up here, because we care about mission, we care about service, and we care about the American people, and we care about getting things done, and I'm honored to be with this group to talk about just that. Thank you very much, and oh man, the whole eyesight thing. I would like to introduce Representative Bost, that, um, my colleague. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Mike Bost, um, let me first off by saying I am honored to stand up here with all of these combat veterans. I am not a combat veteran. I'm a veteran that served, did not serve in combat. But I am the ranking member, and our hopes is to be chairman of the VA committee. 
So without a speaker in place, let's put this in perspective. We cannot organize or conduct our oversight. We cannot hold Biden VA accountable. We cannot do our jobs to ensure veterans are getting the care and benefit that they, they are due. Without a speaker, our committee can't conduct vital important oversight of the implementation of the PACT Act, which we passed this last year. Remember this bill is the largest expansion of health care benefits to over 3.5 million veterans. And we must be, be watching closely to make sure vet, veterans are getting the care and benefits they've earned. Holding a hearing on mental health impacts on the failed Afghan withdrawal. We can't do that through our Veterans Affairs Committees to help the families that we need to help. Overseeing billions of dollars that's spent on the electronic health care records and, and holding Biden's feet to the fire on making sure that the rollout of that is doing everything it can for our veterans and not endangering their lives with, with, with actually rolling it out. And reauthorizing successful VA programs that help trans transitioning service members find jobs after they leave the military. We can't stop this administration and do our job of oversight, which is given to us in the Constitution, until we have a speaker. So not only does it affect those men and women that are in uniform now, it affects every one of them that have served in the past. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Representative uh, Gallagher. Well, just one, uh, one data point to emphasize what's already been said. Right now, uh, Don Bacon and I were supposed to be meeting with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs in the skiff here to talk about matters in the Indo-Pacific. But I'm informed by House Security that technically I don't have a clearance. I, I'm a member of the Intel Committee. I'm on the Armed Services Committee. And I can't meet in the skiff to conduct essential business. My point is we have work to do that we can't do right now. We've seen what happens over the last two years when deterrence fails, when weakness invites aggression. It's up to this Congress to restore deterrence, to restore peace through strength. Well, we aren't able to do that vital work until we actually get past the speaker vote, populate our committees, and start getting to work. And with that, I will introduce my fellow Midwesterner, John James. Good afternoon, John James, Michigan 10. It's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to be standing with my brothers and sisters in arms um, on our next mission. Um, we each swore an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America, and we're planning on doing that. Um, and we are a part, just an example, of, a, of a generations who've come before us who swore that oath as well. There are 80, 80 veterans in this Congress, 62 GOP, and the rest are Democrats. Folks who I hope believe, like I do, that we need to prioritize the needs and security of all Americans. But right now, we're hamstrung from doing that because we're bogged down in things that have taken our focus off the mission. Right now, um, every day, we know uh, that the number has been revised, the number of veterans who commit suicide. The highest proportion being Vietnam veterans whom we didn't welcome back properly and appropriately the very first time. We need to come together and recognize we need to put mission first and people always. And I'm excited to get started. Uh, we have a common vision to put service before self. And we can't do that if there are people in our own conference who are putting self before service. We are the land of the free and the home of the brave. But it occurs to me as I talk to my colleagues that there is a lot of governing on fear. I was taught by my commanders as I was leading folks in my Apache platoon into combat, into the bullets to protect American lives and our interests abroad in combat in Iraq, that never to mistake hesitance for fear. There are folks among the 20 who are not voting with the nominee from our party, Kevin McCarthy, because they're scared. The business of this nation cannot be conducted if we are scared, if we have fear. We have to bridge the gap of trust by recognizing we have to serve people. And I'm excited because, frankly, with the lowest number of veterans that we've had in multiple generations, getting back to having more veterans serve in Congress would bridge these gaps and move us forward without fear. Thank you. Thank you.
Forgive me, no, and I'd like to introduce <laughs> Representative-elect Franklin. Oh, Scott Franklin from Florida. Um, appreciate you all being here today. Um, when I first explored running for Congress, one of the first things I did was to go online, start figuring out who the veterans were, because I knew that these were my brothers and sisters, that we had come from different backgrounds, but at the end of the day, we had all put on a uniform and figured out how to solve a mission. That's why we're here. We want to get things done. That's why the American public has sent us here. You know, I hear bannered around these halls all the time, people invoking founding fathers, talking about this is the people's house and we the people. If we think about that, if 10% of, the, of a small, of the overall number had been allowed to carry the day in the summer of 1776, we've never had a, a, a declaration of independence. There would be no people's house. We would have never gotten a constitution passed through the constitutional convention had 10% of the people been allowed to hold out and allow the other 90, deny the other 90% the ability to get things done. The public has called on us to get a job done. I often think, you know, my, my favorite of the memorials here in D.C. is uh, the Vietnam Memorial. I happened to sneak out when I was at the Naval Academy on the day that was, uh, was uh, unveiled back in the early 80s, and it's just always had a special place for me. When I think of all the number of problems we have right now, one of those is fentanyl. We are losing more people every single year now to fentanyl crossing our Mexican border than we lost in the entirety of the Vietnam War. If you want to put that in perspective, go out again sometime and walk down that wall and look at those names. We have tens of thousands of Americans every single year now dying of fentanyl, and we have an administration that refuses to take on the problem. That's one of dozens we could talk about. We've got work to do. We're wasting time, and the public deserves better. Uh, next up, General Kelly. Thank you guys. I'm Trent Kelly from Mississippi, and I've served for over 37 years in the military. And we're here to accomplish a mission, but we have to do that. And one of the things that frustrates me the most is I've served in combat and I've led troops in combat. But when you have troops that question decisions of leaders without good basis for doing so, you have to either articulate that basis or get out of the way. So think about this. Uh, we need U.S. Grant here, unconditional surrender. You have 20 people demanding that 201 surrender to them unconditionally. Well, I will not surrender unconditionally. If you have conditions, give them to us. We'll consider them. Doesn't mean we'll do them, but you have to talk about them. But we've asked and we've asked, what is it you want? What do you need? But you have 20 people demanding the unconditional surrender of including this group of warriors, we will not unconditionally surrender. Tell us what you want. We might surrender if you tell us the terms, but just so you know, we're in the strong position. There's 201 of us and 20 of them. And with that, I yield back, and I will be followed by Mr. Garcia. Thank you, General. Uh, Mike Garcia from California. It's an honor to be here sharing the stage with true patriots. Uh, everyone on this stage at some point in their life was willing to give their life in defense of this precious gift called the United States of America. We would still do the same so that our fellow Americans don't lose their liberties, their freedoms in this uh, very special uh, experiment called America. It's a continuation of what our founding fathers did when they came out of Constitution Hall. They weren't all ecstatic. They all made compromises. They all gave in to certain uh, concessions that maybe uh, they didn't feel good about. But with that, we were given the Constitution of the United States and, and the liberties that we now enjoy therein. And so what matters to the American people right now is not the squabbling within the halls of Congress. What matters to them is literally 200 people today will die of fentanyl, that three to 5,000 people will cross our southern border illegally without any account, that the Chinese government today will steal about $1 billion of intellectual property from American companies, and that there are Chinese communist DF-41 intercontinental ballistic missiles aimed at our heads here in the United States while Congress is, is fighting this internal battle. We've had the concessions, we've had the compromise, we've had our internal elections and the conversations that were a continuation of what our founding fathers have done. And we need to put all of that behind us, do our jobs as members of Congress, legislate, a, uh, elect a member, excuse me, the Speaker of the House so that we can actually be members of Congress and move forward. And once again, protect this beautiful nation like we have all done in the past. Many of us uh, were very close to giving our lives in defense of this country, and we will do whatever it takes to make sure that we can continue that. With that, I'll introduce my good friend, Brad Winstrup. Brad Winstrup from Ohio. 25 years of, of military service, and I've been here for 10 years. And since I've been here, one of the things that I noticed over time, and this is from both sides of the aisle, if you want to get things done, it, it helps when you have veterans involved. 
veterans, and I'm a physician, veterans and doctors, we come together, we get things done. There's a mission out there. That's not what we're seeing today. And you know, in the military, you know, when you get promoted, you have been promoted by your peers. Your peers have selected you for promotion. And you live with that. And some people may not agree with that promotion. But you live with it and you go out and accomplish the mission. These guys have all talked about the many missions that we have as members of Congress. We want to get going on it. We want to get going on it. But we have some people that won't want to live with the decision of their peers. And that's for Kevin McCarthy to be Speaker of the House. We've got to solve this because we've got to go to work because you all deserve it. I yield back to yeah. Mike Waltz. Thank, Thank you. you okay, questions? Any other security thing that you don't have access to right now because of what's going on? Where did Gallagher go? Yeah. We, yeah. We, don't have, we don't have access to anything. Normally there would be... The facility where we work every day, we can't go in there right now. And norm, Yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah this, the secure facility that we work in every day when we're here, we can't go in there right now because we're not. So as threats are around the world, we would get daily briefs if we want them. We're in there all the time. And right now, we can't be in there at all. And we have the job of oversight over the intelligence community and the things that are taking place around the world. And I think Mr. Gallagher touched on that per, uh, very eloquently today, where a meeting he was supposed to have on a very significant part of this world and what's going on there and how it can affect America and our, and our national security, they can't have that meeting. Yeah, and, and, and I'll just, I mean, in addition, Representative Gallagher, uh, with the vote of the Congress, um, was supposed to be, uh, or has been chosen to be, the, the chair of the China Select Committee that we're not getting underway. I'm supposed to uh, be sitting down and talking about the recruiting crisis. Apparently, the National Guard has been informed by the Department of Army that uh, the vaccine mandate that we put into law only applies to active duty, but not the National Guard. The repeal of the vaccine mandate uh, doesn't apply to the National Guard. So there are all kinds of issues uh, that only we can work out uh, and work through on these national security committees, and we're not doing it. So, uh, given the stakes that you've presented here, um, are all of you just Kevin McCarthy and nobody else, or is it? Are, are there going to be conversations in the very near future, like tonight or maybe tomorrow, that it's time to start thinking about maybe Mr. McCarthy might have to step aside I think, and start thinking about somebody else? No, I think the frustration has been these conversations have been going on for months and months, and I'll just speak for myself and anybody else feel free to step up. Uh, but McCarthy has given concession after concession, many of them very good. I think many of them we agree with. This body does need to change, and certainly after the last several years under Nancy Pelosi. Uh, so we, I actually thought it was moving in a right direction, but, but this group has now managed to kind of snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, uh, and, uh, and, and the victory was this Republican majority. I'm going to vote for Kevin McCarthy as long as he's on the ballot. That is what we uh, that's what we committed to do, and I certainly share my colleague's sen sentiment, uh, uh, Representative Kelly's sentiment, that there is negotiations and then there's holding the rest of us hostage. And 20 don't get to do that to 201. I don't know if anyone else. I can. Please. I'm just going to speak up. I'm not a combat veteran. I'm a 24-year veteran. My husband, 30 years, and I'm a doctor. We don't question the hearts of our colleagues who are voting no. We know, like the majority of Americans, that they feel the country is on the wrong track and that Republicans were put in charge and in a majority to get the country on the right track. What we're asking is that they listen to their heart but also start listening to their intellect and to their brain. And I would implore people in our districts to give us the concession that because we are here and we're voting for Kevin McCarthy, there are reasons that we do so, that we think he's the best person to be the speaker at this time, and for them to trust in us that we know that, and to start contacting all of the veterans in Congress, both the incoming who have never been sworn in and those of us waiting to be sworn in, waiting to be chairs of committees, 
to implore those members voting no to vote yes, to allow us to set up committees, to allow us to set up investigations, to allow us to pass a bill that would defund 87,000 IRS agents who are going after small businesses and average Americans, to allow us to put forward an energy independent agenda, to allow us to secure our border. I would implore them to ask them to use their intellect because this game is ending and it is ending soon. Thank you. Sir. Hey, Derek Rumbach from NBC News. You guys have talked about you're having this prep press conference. But what are you doing from a member to member basis? What conversations are you having to try to convince these 20? Well, look, I mean, I asked uh, a member, one of the no votes this morning, what is it? We went through everything that's that's been conceded in terms of the rule changes. Uh, and I don't even like to call it a concession. I really think the vast majority of them are, are moving in a positive direction. But what is that thing? Uh, and the answer I got back was things have got to change. Well, that's, <laughs> I mean, we need specifics, right? Uh, and, and what our think you're hearing in our collective frustration is we're not getting anything specifically back what gets us to that 218 with Kevin McCarthy so that we can move forward because we have just as many as you saw from vote after vote after vote it's not as though momentum is shifting each side's digging their trenches deeper and I think that's a disservice to those men and women that are overseas depending on us and to the people who elected us and I don't know if, yeah go ahead man I, I think I've talked to probably 15 different members who are, are voting for someone other than Kevin McCarthy. And I've asked them, what do you want? What does it take? What can I do to help us get there? And I've not gotten a, an articulate answer of exactly what's needed. Now, I'm not mad at any of those people, and I think they all have justifiable reasons why they are where they are. But that being said, we have to come to something that allows us to get there. And I think that those guys are meeting with uh, Kevin McCarthy now and with other members of leadership. Uh, I think each person here, uh, Don Bacon saw me last night. I mean, I, I've engaged with almost every single member who has voted for someone other than McCarthy in a good way. Because we've got to bring the temperatures down. We can't call names. We can't be ugly to people. But what we've got to do is say, what do you want and how do we get there? I can either give it or I can't. And we've got to do that. But I think almost everyone is having one-on-one -on -one conversations. Yeah, point. sure. Yeah, I think it's important for everyone to recognize, and I think you guys get this, but I don't know that the average American understands the process with this yet. This didn't just start yesterday, right? This is, this is on the back of two months of meetings, and I think we've had something uh, like 16 meetings as, as either a larger group as a conference or with these folks and, and, and leadership or other members uh, within our conference. Uh, and, and we actually did make roughly 22 changes to the rules package that were a direct result of the conversations with some of these folks that are objecting to this. So, uh, you know, above all things, the, the folks on this stage, we, we don't put a human being on a pedestal. Uh, we, we put the Constitution and law and order and the process and the protocols and the procedures uh, that we abide by as Americans on the pedestal. We have gone through those processes, those protocols, uh, with a vast majority ending up with an answer. And, and uh, now all we're asking for is to honor that uh, and to close the deal and, and simply call for the, uh, the, the final election. Okay, we'll do two more. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Michelle Shin from National Journal. So it appears that GOP holdouts are demanding committee slots. Uh, specifically, Matt Gates wants to chair arm, the Armed Services Committee. Um, so what do you think about that? Well. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't I, I think everything, I think that's part of the problem. I think you get part of the answers. I think, uh, listen, I think Matt wants to be a subcommittee chair, not the chair of armed services, okay? And, and, uh, but, but he doesn't want to go through the regular process. And so, although that's admirable for him, I, wanted, I was at that point one time, and I want to be the chairman of Sea Power right now, but I don't get to demand that. I have to earn that. And I think Matt's earned that in a lot of ways. So I think if he would depend on people doing the right thing, I think he can get there, but I think making demands does not work. But I think all those things are kind of a little bit taken out of context. I don't think he made a threat, and I, don't think, I, I just don't think that that's exactly the way it went down. Yeah, look, I'll just, from my perspective, we're the party... Uh, of competition. We're the party of merit. We're not the party of quotas because of a group that you belong to. Uh, there are members of this stage who are competing right now with their peers, amongst their peers, and making the case to their peers for chairmanships, uh, not holding 201 members who are duly elected hostage 
uh, for for their agenda. So I'm not I don't know about that specifically, but in general, again, uh, there are moving there's moving the country forward, moving the party forward, and then when you start getting into personal agendas, uh, that's where I think you're going to see us draw the line. Anybody else want to? I'm on that. I, I wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. So, I'm, I'm Dr. Rich McCormick. Obviously, I've never been in Congress before. I'm not a politician. I uh, spent 16 years in the Marine Corps as a pilot in uh, Airborne. Spent another four years in the Navy as an ER doc. Been over to Afghanistan. Been in the Persian Gulf. One of the things, this is not the military, obviously. This is Congress. We are one body of many parts. You have some really, cons I consider myself a very conservative person. We have some moderates. It's okay we reflect the 750,000 people that each one of us have as a district. And we all have differences of opinion. The problem is that some people think that, that their way is the only way. And that's not collectively how we represent. And this is the problem that we're having right now in Congress, is that when you have 90% of a body say we want this, and that's how it's been done for the last hundred years. Uh, how do we move forward when we're trying to actually full find representation of the people? It's okay to have differences, and we shouldn't say that one person has a cornerstone on what defines a conservative, because I think most of us all feel like we're conservative people, and that respecting each other and what we have chosen as a body, as a caucus, is really important, but we're not doing that right now. And I think one of the, the leadership importances about McCarthy is that he actually allows people to be ultra-conservative or be more moderate based on their, on their representation. And having that as leadership is what's respectively what's going to bring us to, uh, to keep the majority. Yeah. I, I want to be clear with everybody. Absolutely, we will compromise. We will compromise, but we will not capitulate. And there's a very serious difference. There's 222 Republicans in our conference now. So if 20 people are able to drive this train however they want to, 202 of us might as well go home because that means they are the conference. That means they, they, those 20 people will be the majority. Well, that is capitulation, and we will not do that. Compromise, yes. We run through a whole bunch of stuff with these uh, guys and gals that, that uh, see things a little bit different, but 20 people are not going to be the majority of this House. 222 Republicans will, including them when they come back home. Last question. Yes, um, so it seems like the Republican agenda has already been set. You already have bills that you want to move forward, aside from the delay from Speaker. I mean, I know you're saying that you only want Kevin McCarthy right now, or obviously he's your choice, but aside from the delay, how much do you think that having Kevin McCarthy is going to impact your constituency? How much do you think the American people actually hear that it is only Kevin McCarthy? I think the American, I, so, I mean, to your point, I don't think it's about Kevin McCarthy or Steve Scalise or Jim Jordan or anybody else uh, up on this stage. It's about the agenda. That's what we all campaigned on. It's not only our agenda, it's stopping an agenda that we believe is destructive for this country, whether it's going from the Abraham Accords to total chaos and the worst withdrawal since Saigon in Afghanistan, open border, fentanyl deaths. Uh, inflation out of control, crime out of control. It's about the agenda. That's the frustration uh, that you're hearing. And we believe that Kevin McCarthy laid out that agenda, helped many members, including some that are voting no to him, directly helped them get elected, and can govern a conference with a lot of different viewpoints. And I'll hand it off. Yeah. yeah. Corey Mills from Florida, 7th District. You, know, you hear all these numbers that are being tossed out, 291 years of service, 246 years as a nation, 20 people who are holding this up, 201 who are voting this way. There's only one number I'm thinking about right now. We have 13 Gold Star families who, because of the failed Afghan withdrawal, still don't have the closure they deserve. The American people, this is not political. They care about those 13 Gold Star members. They care about those who are sacrificing their lives for this nation. And if anything, we should be getting ready to hold oversight and bring those in who are responsible for this, responsible for the thousands who are left behind, responsible for all the Americans who have died from the fentanyl overdoses. This is something that should be important to all 334 million Americans. It's not Democrat or Republican. This is not about one speaker or the other. This is about getting answers, getting oversight, and holding those accountable who are responsible for the deaths of real Americans who have fought and served this country. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
did too, Molly. 